So we're, we're pleased for the opportunity to, uh, to have with us tonight um, five of, of the authors of uh, an anthology, this book called Turning Points, Discovering Meaning and Passion in Turbulent Times. And I'll mention that um, uh, there are 20 different stories in this wonderful book, and uh, we are fortunate to have five of the authors and one of the editors here with us tonight. Um, I won't uh, introduce them now, but rather they'll, I think, be introduced as, as each different one is coming up. But they are all part of the Peace and Social Justice Writing Group of the Loft Literary Center. Um, the subtitle of this book is Discovering Meaning and Passion in Turbulent Times. And I want to read just two very short things that I think will, will help uh, provide some, some uh, focus on what we're talking about here. So this is uh, excerpted from the introduction in the book. And it says, It is clear as the 20th century recedes into history that more than ever we need these stories of people at the passion-filled turning points in their lives. Historians looking back on this period will have many accounts of the way leaders like a Betty Friedan or a Tom Hayden made their decisions to move in one direction or another, but not as much about those who escaped the spotlight chose to live out their lives. So that's by Lawrence Peters, who's one of the uh, editors. And then also from the, uh, the, the foreword, and uh, the foreword is written by uh, John, John Noltner, whom many of you will recognize his name as a result of the wonderful uh, uh, exhibits that he, uh, that he puts up around the cities and around the country called A Piece of Our Mind. Do I have the name right? Is that it, A Piece of Our Mind? Yeah, and he wrote the foreword to the book, and he says, in this collection, you will find stories of transformed moments those aha moments when we have a clarity of vision and purpose. Sometimes that clarity fades, but other times it redefines us and changes the course of our lives. Um, and then I was also struck by uh, find, finding meaningful uh, in the beginning to uh, really put things in perspective. Uh, they have in the front of the book uh, a quote from Elie Wiesel. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. So those are good words to keep in mind, I think, and set some context. So uh, kicking things off, will it be you, Phil? So let's welcome the, the writers here tonight. And Phil Lund uh, will be speaking first. Can we make sure you have the clip on mic? Sure. Thank you for coming. I am the facilitator for the Peace and Social Justice Writers Group. And I'm going to give you just a little introduction. Dennis did a great job. He said really what needed to be said. Um, and uh, as far as the introduction to the book, I'll tell you a little bit about the, um, the history or the genesis of the book. Um, Bird, as you all know, has written the Compassionate Rebel Revolution series. And it was because that book was discovered in Washington, D.C. by a publisher by the name of Changing Times Press that they approached us, approached Bird actually, and Bird came to the group and we um, put the idea out to the group, are we interested in writing essays for a potential book? And many people stepped forward. So 11 of us in the book, of the 20, are from the Peace and Social Justice Writers Group. And there are, there's a scattering of other people actually from around the world that have contributed to it. The Writers Group started in 2006. Uh, I've been the facilitator for many years. Um, and we've done a number of things. Some of you are familiar with it. Uh, back in 2007, 8, and 9, somewhere in that vicinity, we did a couple of Art of Peace festivals at the Loft. They were all-day events with workshops and presentations and performances. One year focused uh, strictly on Iraqi art. We had a dual Iraqi and American art exhibit at the Loft. 
Um, we've also done a couple of, well, a couple of publications. This is our most recent. Uh, a few years back, we did a small chapbook where we did a small uh, uh, selection of, or a compilation of poems and essays and other pieces. And most recently, in the last couple of years, 2014, we got the Loft Literary Center commemorated as an international peace site. And then this publication we worked on for a couple of years, and that's where we're at. So I, that's how the book came to be, um, and that's what the writers group is all about. So at that point, I'm going to stop, and we're going to move right into readings, because we want to get at around 8 o'clock or so, get to kind of a sort of a mini workshop session or dialogue session, which is, re which is really what we're about. We do it every time we meet, which is once a month. Um, but we find that's the most uh, productive and engaging part of what we do, where we actually get people engaged in the thought process of how do we solve some of these problems that we talk about. So I'm going to pass it back to Robbie Orr, and he'll be our MC for the evening. Hello all, thank you for inviting us here. And the first uh, presenter tonight is Bert Berlow, who mentioned uh, he'd been instrumental in this book. He's also an award-winning journalist and author, lives in Minneapolis, and writes the stories of untold ordinary people who are changing the world. He's authored seven books, including the Compassionate Rebel series. And I give you now Bert Barlow. Thanks, Rob. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi. I think most of you know me. You know, I, I, um, Yeah, how do you want to be, how do you want me to do this? All right. Actually, my experience with uh, Citizens for Global Solutions and uh, goes back a ways that Dennis and Robin mentioned my Compassionate Rebel book and uh, when this group was meeting over at Hennepin Avenue Church a number of years ago, um, they were kind enough to have me come in and do a presentation with a gentleman named Ahmed Tharwat who was featured in my book. And so it's, it's, really, it's really great to be, great to be back here. Um, I'm going to talk. We're, we're, we're talking about turning points in this. Uh, that, and we hope that some of you, after we're done, will be able will share some of your turning point stories with us. And I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the turning points that led me to do some of the things that I'm doing right now, and um, how things kind of tie together. You know, this is the 50th anniversary of 1968. And I'm sure that all of you are very learned people and you know that, that 1968 was a year of, uh, of great turbulence in our society. Um, we had the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. We had the uh, demonstrations at the Democratic National Convention. We had the Vietnam War was still going strong. We had the Tet Offensive and My Lai. And we had people pro stepping up to protest against the war. We had the women's movement, civil rights movement, uh, all gaining a lot of strength. Um, there are a number of, uh, and worldwide as a matter of fact, uh, Mark Kolansky in his book about 1968 <laughs> talks about uh, Prague and Mexico and things were going on all over the world the people were stepping up and uh, it was a world-changing year of global and social upheaval where many global issues came to the forefront a number of parallels that we have seen um, last night I was all of us were moved in the wrong direction by the shooting in Florida 
and the fact that we haven't been able to get any gun control legislation out. Turns out 1968, after the shootings of, of Kennedy and, and King, there was a gun control bill passed by President Johnson in Congress, um, Gun Control Act of 1968. We haven't had a whole lot happen since that time. In 1968, I was, um, it kind of, came of age in the 1960s, as some of you may have. And I kind of grew up on uh, rock and roll and began to, and as a, in a journalism career and began to be more active in, or start thinking about things that were going on in the world. Um, and, th and I got uh, very angry and upset at times. Uh, I was inspired a great deal by uh, by President Kennedy when I heard him speak in 1963 um, over a loudspeaker on my campus. Um, but for several years in the mid-60s, I didn't really fully acknowledge the restlessness and searching that was stirring inside of me, waiting to emerge and be part of larger dreams. Uh, a lot of what I wrote is about the American dream and how it changed from the 50s when it was all about conformity and upper mobility and pretty innocent time. And in the 60s when uh, we had King's speech and people started talking more about dreams. So the, night, the events of 1968 um, shook the world around me and I've mentioned some of those, the assassinations, the civil rights protests, the riots at the convention, the war abroad, the continuing movement to end it. And I began to search for ways to become actively involved in peace and justice. And gradually my dreams became less centered around gratification and more about imagining a better world for humankind. I had become, growing up in the 60s, I had become a fan of Elvis Presley who I first heard in the 1950s. And um, uh, had sort of followed his career through the 60s and when it was uh, coming and then diminishing. But I, 1968 was a tough year and I, I was kind of looking for something that would get me out of my box of pursuing a journalism career and looking at other things going on and not so much, just not so much what I can do in the world. Um, in 1968 was coming to an end. I was inspired by a song that Elvis Presley sang at a comeback concert, which was broadcast all over the world. It was called If I Can Dream, and if we had more time tonight, we would play that for you. And it took up the speech of Dr. K the theme of Dr. King's speech to represent a new American dream. Uh, he later recorded another song called In the Ghetto, and he was no longer just a revolutionary rock icon, he had become a dreamer of social change. Uh, that song is inspired to me even today. And the following year in 1969, um, I went to New York City and marched in a huge march against the Vietnam War. It was a moratorium, was, at that time was the largest protest march in American history. And we don't have time for me to read all about it, but you can. Um, I'll just read one paragraph and then close out with this, because this was this turned out that 68 was a turning point. It was a turning point in Elvis's career. It was a turning point in, in our country. It was, we were in turbulent times and uh, it was definitely where we ha had to see where we were gonna go from there. But it was a turning point in my life in terms of uh, beginning to move in the direction of writing and activism. I walked amidst the groups of people in front and behind and alongside as the soundtrack of singing and chanting of anti-war songs and slogans echoed through the misty air. The street was filled for miles on end with all kinds of people, young and old, black and white, 
pastors and teachers and students and laborers and housewives, men and women pushing baby strollers, carrying children on their backs, the peacemakers of the future getting their first taste of public protest. Although we didn't know each other personally, there was a camaraderie brought on by the shared feelings and emotions and commitment of that day. I felt no longer alone, but part of a larger movement. I could not be sure if or when the war would end, but for the first time since it began, I personally felt the political wind shifting. On the ride back home, I began to journal about that experience. And I later wrote a story about that day in New York City, setting in motion a lasting connection between my writing and my activism that we continue to this day. So we all have these turning points in our lives, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from the rest of you in the room here tonight to think about what are the turning points in your life that led you to do whatever it is you'd like to do, it's writing, activism, teaching, uh, doing good work out in the community, whatever. So this is the book, Turning Points. And I, I want to just close by saying that this book is as it turns out, extremely timely right now. Um, we are in a time when our, when our, our, our globe is, and our, and our country uh, are going through a lot of turbulence. And we're, going th and we're also at a turning point, I think, in our country right now and, and where we're going to go. And the encouraging thing about what's happened since the election is that people from all over are beginning to step up. And... Uh, women have done tremendous, uh, minorities uh, coming forth and speaking out for what they believe in and finding the turning points in their lives that's gonna, that has led them to find, some of them have never, never been involved before, uh, has, has led them to pursue the national and global issues that they're concerned about. And we commend them for that. So I'm looking forward to the, finding the turning points in your life and at this point, I'll, go, I'll turn it back to Robbie. Thank you all very much. We'll be around. And uh, this intervention is a little bit of a Department of Redundancy department because we've already met Phil. And, uh, but in addition to some of the points mentioned earlier about the coordinator of the Loft Peace and Justice Group, he's been building community in other ways with peace festivals, art festivals, and through his work as a professional architect and writer. And so tonight we can learn a little bit about what put him on that path. So this is a coming of age story. Uh, it really is about how I came to come to grips with sort of a world sense or a global sense of looking at how things are. Um, and I'm going to jump right into it. It really is more about not so much a particular turning point, which, which I will sort of allude to, but it's more of a thickening for me. It's more of a fixing or a, an entrenching of a particular notion. In my piece, which you can read in my, in my essay if you are interested in picking up the book, I, I, I refer to a, a finding the lost chord. And this was an underwriting theme or underlying theme in the 60s and 70s where people were searching for something to latch on to. For me, I had latched onto it. I just needed to, to really bury it and dig it deep in my soul. So I'll just jump right into my piece. So what you're going to hear is a number of excerpts which I've culled together and sort of created a presentation out of it. Not yet 20, with a youthful self-confidence and the relishing of adventure, I undertook an enlightening story or an enlightening, enlightening journey to the East, hungering to learn more about the world's underpinnings, uh, to witness all of its beauty and ugliness, and to overcome my own naivete I knew I had to find my place in it. If I were to contribute, it would be because I was capable of a deep understanding, one tempered by first-hand experience, by the will to know, and by the endurance of hardship. This is my story. It's a telling of a journey. It's one of awakening, one of questioning. It's as much about the gaining of a strength to constantly overcome adversity as it is about the will to shape things. To become part, to become actually become part of the earth, to become the earth's guardian, it's about the realization of a need to act and to play a part. As I entered high school in the 1960s, I studied poverty, overpopulation, 
and mobilized friends to get involved in the environmental movement. It seemed that these were places where I could begin, where I might create a conversation where things needed shaping. Before, before running and walking fundraisers were commonplace, I joined a planning committee in Madison, Wisconsin uh, to create the second Walk for Development. And at that time, uh, the first one had been held in San Francisco. Substantial money was raised and used to launch, uh, to teach farming techniques in the poverty-stricken communities of Biloxi, Mississippi and Chad, Africa. I became a part of contingent of planners at Madison area schools to help spearhead the first nationwide Earth Day campaign formulated by Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson to raise environmental awareness. At that time, I had a zeal for life and held the belief that by exposing myself to other cultures, languages, and customs, I would gain a more global perspective and in some way become wiser. At 18, I set out for my sophomore year of college in Copenhagen, Denmark. I made forays into the Soviet Union, Communist East Germany, and many parts of Europe. After that year, my lust for travel remained, and so did I. I worked at a beer hall in the vineyards of southern France, and saved money and made preparations to keep on traveling. My next adventure would be a more grueling one. I next set out on a long overland journey to India and Nepal. I knew the world was changing and that places like Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan would not remain the same. How prophetic that all seems now. How fortunate I was to see that part of the world then. While in Turkey I was confused by the steady stare of men's faces or eyes and by the intimidating close proximity of strangers talking to me, only to learn that such body language and positioning is part of that culture. In my architectural work, I have called upon this experience. Not long ago, by studying human proxemics, that's the study of human relationships in space, I used the knowledge to gain, uh, to assist with the design of a treatment center for, for the victims of torture. Survivors of torture lose trust in the closeness of others, and therefore the creation of healing spaces is essential for recovery. Where natural light is present, colors are non-agitating, a safe exit is visible, and furniture arrangements are non-threatening. Amnesty International estimates that at least 81 world countries, world governments, currently practice torture, some of them openly, according to the organization's 2008 report. Healing work is necessary to overcome the deep pain caused by physical and psychological abuse. Healing is also necessary to mend the divisions caused by other forms of injustice, wrongs committed to whole populations throughout history. Pain leaves an imprint, and it's one that lasts for generations. Today, I work towards progress, and I often reflect upon that trip and the early lessons learned. In progressive voices, there is wisdom I align myself with them. Forward-thinking people articulate and advance the social, political, and environmental issues of their time. Human history is permeated with advancements that are defined by their age. The age of reason, the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, the Industrial Age, the Space Age, the Age of Technology. Perhaps now, due to all these advances, civilization is asking us to put the human race in order that we advance all of our interworkings, that we, using all of our previous forward movements in so many complex disciplines, come together in an age of human understanding. We can work together to overcome our most complicated problems, terrorism, overpopulation, the lack of resources, the falling of our planet, the rise of seemingly random acts of violence, the increase in suicide rates, the migration of peoples in search of work, the consumption of, consumption of valuable capital, to fuel unnecessary wars that maim the minds of hearts, maim the minds, hearts, and so, uh, spirits of soldiers. Ages define themselves as if there is something in the air, something contagious, where we all are formulating, all working for answers, all at the same time. The answers to our current problems will not merely be found in new technologies, in falling back on our religions, in our search for other habitable places all over the universe. We must join our best minds with our deepest understandings. It's in our working together, in our local communities, in our private conversations, as active agents that will shape a better future. Thank you.
And our uh, next presenter is Jacqueline Mazio. She's uh, editor par excellence and a writer in her own right, has lived in uh, Colombia or Mexico and got her MFA from Colombia. Again, thank, um, thank you all for coming. It's really wonderful to be invited here. Microphone. Um, do you want me to put it on? It's good. It's good. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Good. Um, I just want to mention that the uh, cover art is by one of the essayists, Christina Katelka. And this is a picture of the memory tree. Very, very appropriate. <laughs> um, and as editor, it was just, a, it's a great pleasure for me to have done this work. I, uh, you would think that having read all the essays innumerable times that I would be tired of them. No, uh, they're gems. And they, it's just like they become more brilliant the more I know them and the more I hear them. My essay is called Scenes from a Life. What is a life? What are our lives? We yearned for a new world, keenly sensing that there were other ways to be as individuals and as a society. We banded together, struggled, lived, learned, lost, and scattered. We stood, facing the horizon, to see what was to be revealed. Scene, Prague, August 20th, 1969. The anniversary of the Russian invasion that brought an end to the Prague Spring. I was there on purpose. I had followed these events. The hopefulness of liberalization in Czechoslovakia under reformist Alexander Dubček. The crushing finality of 200,000 invading Eastern Bloc troops and their 2,000 tanks, and the resistance of the Czech people. Jan Palak, a 20-year-old history and political economy student, had set himself ablaze in protest in Wenceslas Square in January. Wenceslas Square is the town center of Prague, where streets and the old tram lines crossed the, the several block rectangle. At noon on August 20th, everything stopped. Silence filled the square and surrounding streets. The old buildings almost looked startled at the sudden silence. It was the only protest that could be risked. That evening, I was in the square with newfound friends. Wenceslas Square was full of commuters changing trams and making their way home when the occupying army moved in and announced via bullhorns that the square must be cleared immediately. We began running to escape the soldiers and their batons. The jostling crowd squeezed into the narrow streets beyond the square. Our path took us in front of the Czech National Museum, where earlier someone had pointed out the bullet pockmarks left from the invasion a year ago. We were moving as fast as we could. Behind me was a soldier, his arm raised. The baton thwacked my so shoulders. In that instant, I viscerally understood power and its misuse. The impact of that blow went beyond the Russians, the Czech people, and their lost hope. Clearing the square was a contrived operation to terrorize and abuse the population to remind them who was in control. And this is the same pattern of all oppressive, overreaching, power-hungry states. That insight informed my stance in the face of all official repression. Is there a social justice gene? If there is, it might explain why I earnestly watch TV news programs and try to come up with solutions to the grave problems I heard about, the Cold War, food shortages, at age six. I would drop off to sleep pondering the news and ways to solve the world's problems. Is this an instinct we have? If so, it's underdeveloped, underutilized, and undervalued. 
Paris, scene one. The lawn of the US Embassy in Paris, November 1969. A group of Americans living in Paris has organized to protest the war in Vietnam. Dozens of white wooden crosses are planted in the small space of green. A member of the Paris American Friends Service Committee, a Quaker working with Thich Nhat Hanh, takes us to meet him. We began a three-day protest fast. There are maybe 40 of us. Scene two. Thanksgiving dinner for American students studying in Paris. Our group of fasters files in and stand silently along the walls around the dining hall <clears throat> as the names of the war dead are slowly read. A woman in our group, weak from fasting, sinks to the floor. Most of the students ignore us, but some stand with us briefly before the protest ends. Cuernavaca, Mexico, a gathering of friends, September 1973. We are in shock about the coup d'etat that deposed and killed Chilean President Salvador Allende on September 11th. Someone comes with the news that Charles Horman, an American journalist and writer who visited Cuernavaca with his wife Joyce on their way to Santiago de Chile, is missing and presumed dead. We knew them. Charles' father would later travel to Chile to try to find his son's body and piece together what happened to him and who was responsible for his death. The Costa Gavras movie, Missing, tells the story of the father's search and the U.S. involvement in the coup. Within a few months, hundreds of Chileans began arriving in Mexico released from prisons and torture houses. Scene two, the small garden outside my house. It is dark and I am holding a two-year-old boy in my arms. He reaches for the reflection of the full moon in the birdbath. His mother is hospitalized in Mexico City. Her friends are taking care of her child. They they were all arrested, beaten, and tortured, they tell me. But her injuries are so serious that she will not survive. For me, there was no one moment that set me on my path. It was more of an ongoing dialogue with reality, with life that deepened my understanding. A growing awareness was fed by others by experience, reading, learning, something within responds and recognizes the truth of things. Scene. A hill beyond the industrial port of Lazaro Cardenas, Michoacan, in Mexico. I'm taking a photo of a woman in front of a flimsy shack where her three very young children are sitting on a mat. Nearly a hundred desperately poor families had built cardboard and corrugated metal shacks along a ridge. Construction, a steel factory, and other work in the government's development zone offer a way out of poverty. People from all across Mexico migrated to the West Coast in hopes of finding work. I was teaching photography at the local Casa de la Cultura Cultural Center and worked with my students to document the dra dramatic changes in the region. In this case, I was pho photographing the damage caused by a flood that had washed away houses in the settlement and filled others with mud. The woman in the shack casually mentions that the smallest baby will be dead in a day. What is a life? What impact do our lives have? What's the meaning of this vast tapestry with interweavings cross strands and broken threads. A generation of us stood facing the horizon, waiting and working for the revelation of a new world. What was revealed was ourselves. Thank you very much.
And our uh, next presenter is Roy Wolf, a veteran, peace activist, and writer. He's uh, written a book, um, oh, now I thought I remembered it. It's a great name. Many are called, but most are frozen. A guide for hawks, doves, and ostriches. I want you to know, despite our age, we're into technology. And today, the technology via email told me I had seven minutes and 47 seconds to speak up here. And that's it. So, but this first part doesn't count towards that. I wanted to tell you a little bit about not only Veterans for Peace, the organization I'm active in, locally and nationally, uh, but there's something that Veterans for Peace is hosting later this year that you're all invited to, and it's a major event. Uh, ten years ago, and ten years before that, we hosted the National Convention of Veterans for Peace, and we're going to do it again in late August. Anybody can come if you can afford it, the time and the money and so forth. It's going to be held in St. Paul, and uh, it's August 23rd to 26th, if you want to jot that down. And I'm mentioning this because this will be a special convention. Uh, it is. It will be, in August, the 90th anniversary of the Kellogg-Briand Pact, and I'm going to say something brief about that, and the 100th anniversary later in the year of the end of World War I, in November of 1918. Uh, so those realities, the end of that war, the war that was going to end all wars, remember? and the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which was put together by a Frenchman named Briand and, and a guy from St. Paul named Frank Kellogg, who was our Secretary of State back in the 20s. And uh, despite his Republican stature and his uh, anti-European stances, he was converted enough to really work hard and get that pact done, and it was passed in 1928. And believe it or not, 60 countries then and many more later signed an agreement to never go to war. Again, anytime, anywhere. So that's 90 years since that happened. Of course, it was just a few years later than uh, Japan attacked China and things started happening. So even countries, including ours, uh, which signed it, didn't follow it. Um, and uh, that's still going on, of course. But it is illegal for America to be involved in a war. It's absolutely, totally illegal. And uh, we're not abiding by it, obviously. And of course, and some allusion was made to this, we're also cel not celebrating, we're commemorating the fact that the Vietnam Wars, several of its key things, the My Lai Massacre, um, the Catonsville Nine trial, and a lot of the other trials that Don and other people were involved in um, are coming up this year, too. So uh, our, qu our motto, in case you don't know, it doesn't say it on this cap, but is to abolish war. And the reaction I get to that, whoops, sometimes, did I knock it loose? There we go. The reaction I get to saying that, still not working right? Is it? It's okay. Okay. Uh, is that, that's almost foolishness, or why are you wasting your time with such a, a goal to abolish war? Uh, we don't think so. We think it's not only worthwhile, but doable, depending on what happens in the future. Okay, so I'll put that down and use the book. Now starts my seven plus minutes. Uh, I'm near the end. You have your name at the end of the alphabet. You know, you got to be in the back of the book. So uh, my, th this all relates to two trips that I took in the 1990s uh, to go to Korea and Japan, Hiroshima, Japan. Let's make sure this one is on here. Okay, now now it's better, right? Okay, I can't tell from up here. Um, but I'm going to start with the fact that I was um, a member of the U.S. Army in the 1950s. I think I'm the eldest person in the room here uh, because you're all talking about the 60s, and I'm a 50s guy and a 60s guy, I hope. Um, but uh, my chapter here starts out, I've been a member of VFP nationally and locally since 1985, so that's 33 years in the local organization. But in the 1950s, I spent two years of my life in the U.S. Army, most of that time in Korea, South Korea. I'd arrived on a troop ship after the shooting part of the war had ended, 
and became part of what's called an occupation army in a divided country where millions of people have been killed within a short war, uh, just three years, at least uh, four and a half million people died, three million of those in North Korea, mostly civilians, and a million and a half at least in South Korea, mostly civilians. The four, 16 months I spent in Korea was part of an effort to s restore some semblance of order to the lives of those who had survived the war. My job was returning land and buildings that we Americans had confiscated from Korean civilians to take part in the war. Now we're trying to give shelter and food to hundreds of thousands of civilians who, who didn't have the necessities of life. These included many, many widows and orphans, tens of thousands of orphans. Uh, that's when I wrote this chapter. Actually, I found out just a couple of months ago that at that time, in the 1950s, shortly after the war, when I was there, in a city of one million, there were 100,000 orphans. Probably was more than one million. They couldn't really count the people in that after war devastation, but um, and I still have a lot of memories and pictures of those orphans, including some pictures taken when I was spending Christmas Day of 1956, shortly before in an orphanage, just before I came back to the States. And I'd seen a lot of orphans during my 16 months there, but this was the first time, for some reason, I finally woke up, because I'm slow sometimes in catching on to the real importance of things. Uh, but I looked into the very sad eyes of those orphans, those children in that unheated building in that freezing weather, and I said to myself, this is bullshit. War making is pure, unadulterated bullshit. I no longer want any part of any carrying on that leads to causing this hell on earth. On that Christmas day in that orphanage, I lost it. Lost what? I lost any desire, any willingness to support any part of war making for any reason, any time, anywhere. Many years later, I went back to Asia to peacemaking conferences in South Korea and Hiroshima in 1995 and in North Korea in 2003. What did I find in North Korea? People just as delightful as the South Koreans, just as deserving of peace. So 50 years after the end of the shooting war, some of the North Koreans still had that sad, underfed look. They're not as well taken care of or in as great a situation, and you know that. And there's still no agreement to end the war. That's, I, sh oh, I shouldn't editorialize here, but I'm gonna for just one second. Uh, the reason why we have the tension we have is because America will not sign a peace agreement that ends the war. It's that simple. That's all that has to happen for the things to start going in the right direction. We will not do it. In pre well, I'm going to skip ahead before I really lose my time frame and uh, leave Korea and go to Japan. But before I get to Japan in 1995, I'm going to tell you about a, an amazing adventure that a couple of hundred people started in December of 1994 when they gathered in Auschwitz, Poland, in the most infamous of all the concentration camps of the Nazis, and led, were led by Buddhist monks from Japan on a walk from Auschwitz to Hiroshima, close to 5,000 miles. It took them over eight months to do so. They traversed many countries, almost all of which had been devastated by warfare after World War II, including Vietnam, by the way. Uh, the pilgrims averaged 20 miles a day of walking, were kept going through the spiritual practice of walking, beating a prayer, dr prayer drum, chanting. Eight months later, they arrived in Hiroshima, having covered close to 5,000 miles, and only 100 members of the original group were able to complete the entire journey. And then I'm going to read to you, before I close, four very short poems that I wrote when I got back home, uh, which identify four of the hundred people. I've got eight of them in here, but I'm going to read four short ones to you. Uh, one American, one German, and two Japanese individuals. And uh, to get across to you what kind of people would do something like this, not to indicate that they're that special or that unique, because there are good people like this all over, including people in this room. But this is who, what I was struck by. These are some of the individuals. The first fella, young American, Beyond Joy. That was his name, Beyond Joy. I kid you not. He was a throwback to the 1960s. Tail, tall, excuse me, long blonde hair, quiet. He wore a floppy black hat. 
He walked from Auschwitz to Hiroshima. I kid you not. Try it sometime. Beyond joy. When he arrived, the Japanese children in Osaka knew who he was, even though no words were spoken. A deck of cards appeared. He and they played concentration. I watched them out of the corner of my eye. I don't think he tried to win the game, but he won them. Maya. His name is pronounced Maya, but it's spelled M-A-E-A. -E He's an indigenous person from an island near Chile. He's very good looking, his hair a bit wild. Maya spoke English well and clearly, maybe better than most of us do, because there were no wasted words. Maya was part of what's called the Sacred Run of 1995, when native people, indigenous people from all over the world, ran 1,400 miles from the northern tip of Hokkaido, the northernmost island of Japan, to the southern tip of Kyushu. On one stretch between Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they ran for 35 hours without stopping. All Maya needed to live, including a good camera, was in one bag. I envied him. How many people do we meet who are really free? Naoko. She was 18, had postponed her last year of high school in Tokyo, so she could walk from Auschwitz to Hiroshima. She had reached her destination when I met her on a crowded subway train with Maya from Chile, Anna from Poland, and Ariel from New Hampshire. Her journey had resulted in some nasty insect bites on her legs, but to say her face was merely beautiful is a disservice to reality. I ask for her name. Now how do words on a page communicate to you what I heard? As she spoke, I heard the soft chimes of a wind chimes high on a windy hill. She whispered, my name is Naoko. Naoko, it means gentle speaker. The last one, another Japanese woman, young woman, Hiroko. There is a Zen Buddhist saying, when the pupil is ready, the teacher will appear. I put this on the back page of that book you know that I wrote. When the pupil is ready, the teacher will appear. After I arrived in Japan, I phoned my home in Minnesota and my wife asked me to do two things. First, to go to the Hiroshima Peace Park and take a picture of the sculpture of Sadako, the girl who tried to fold a thousand paper cranes. You know that story. Uh, before she died of radiation poisoning. And then I was supposed to also pray for a friend of ours who was starting her treatments for cancer. I just found out she's still alive, by the way. I was more than willing to make that connection. Later, as I approached the Sadako memorial site, I noticed a young Japanese woman finishing a watercolor painting of the sculpture. So I asked for her name and if I could take a picture of her, her painting, and the Sadako uh, sculpture. So I lined up all three of them. She smiled and complied with my request. Then I asked where she went to school. She smiled and replied, I am the teacher. Yes, you are, Hiroko. When the pupil is ready, the teacher will appear. So to close with a couple of short paragraphs here to sum up the political reality here, since I've been giving you the human small picture, here's the bigger picture. In August of 1945, President Harry Truman, under considerable pressure from the Pentagon, gave the green light to drop the only two atomic bombs in existence on the cities Hiroshima and Nagasaki, causing hundreds of thousands of people, civilians, to die then or soon after. Before Truman gave that approval, he relied on a report from a group of 12 men who had prepared the plans for a late 1945 invasion of Japan. One of those 12 men was my uncle, George Kemmer, an expert in the topography of Japan, especially its coastlines. And those 12 men were responsible for the estimate that an invasion of the two main islands, Honshu and Kyushu, 
of Japan might result in one million Allied casualties, dead and wounded, mostly Americans it would be, in the initial stages of such a invasion, sea to land invasion. For this reason, many people believe that the atomic bombing of Japan was justified or even necessary. However, the full reality of the situation was quite different. Japan was a defeated nation. They knew it, we knew it. And the decision had already been made to get out of the war, to seek a peace negotiation within two to three weeks at most. So the moral questions about all of this remain. Carolyn Forche, a well-known quality American poet, wrote a book-length poem, 110 pages, one poem, called The Angel of History. It's mostly about Hiroshima and the reality of that. And she encourages her readers, including you and me, quote, if you're still able to cry, you should go to Hiroshima. I returned to Korea in 1995 and then went to Hiroshima to make some personal amends, but also to represent an international movement, namely Veterans for Peace, and to give voice to its motto, Abolish War. In my poems, I portrayed a small number of peace messengers and some of the ways they spoke their truth to the powers of this world. The other 50,000 peace pilgrims who were with us that day in Japan had their own reasons made their own statements, but we were of one spirit as we fasted and prayed all day in the hot sun in Hiroshima at their peace park on the 6th of August, 1995. Again, I'm Robbie Orr, St. Paul writer, working on a trilogy called The Repentant Radical, which fits really well with the theme of this book. I mean, what is turning points except a repentance? And what are your turning points? What are turning points we can help be the teacher when we're talking to young people, to old people, people who've never really engaged in questioning the reality. So in my piece in this book, I've kind of, there's really three turning points. One, when I first kind of woke up to there was a world out there. Two, in 1968, when my faith was shattered. And the third, when I became a committed activist. In November of 63, I was living in India. I was born and raised there as the son of uh, medical and uh, technical missionaries. And I had a really pretty good life, but I didn't really think of myself as an American. I mean, I'm sure I was uh, had different color of skin than my Indian friends, and I lived in a nicer house. We were, my parents didn't earn a lot of money, but we had servants, and it was, uh, you know, when we played soccer at the end of each day, it was my soccer ball, so I was the captain, of course. And anyway, I was home on winter vacation from boarding school. I was kind of sleeping in late, and I forgot to uh, set my timer to go off, so <laughs> sorry. But um, I wandered in kind of at the last minute where I could still get breakfast, and my parents were still there, close to nine o'clock. That was really strange. It was, they were huddled around a soft uh, shortwave radio. It was all scratchy, and I just heard little bits about there was a plane crash in Kashmir, and all the top army brass had been killed, and um, something about the president being shot, and I thought, oh, God, here it goes. I didn't say that, of course. I was a missionary boy. So, uh, you know, Something was always happening in India. A few years earlier, the army marched right through our town on the way to Goa to kick out the Portuguese because they wouldn't leave India from their colony. 
the next year, the Chinese War. So I thought this was just another war. And besides, today was Saturday. That's when the one English bookstore in town got its shipment of comics from Bombay. So I got on my bike and I was biking downtown and I was, here comes a postman and he stopped right in front of me, screech, I stopped. He's like, oh, American boy, I'm so sorry. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, okay. He's like, I'm so sorry, he had tears in his eyes. And I kind of like, yeah, yeah, okay. I went racing by and I was going by the bank and here was a elder from the church that was the guard at the bank, big tall guy with his shotgun, bandolier, huge mustache. And he comes up and gives me a big sweaty, smelly hug. And I was like, ah, it's like, I'm so sorry. He was such a good man. Why did they kill him? It's like, who? You're a president. Like, oh, that's an American president who died. Every place I went that day, people were stopping me, telling me how much they loved Kennedy. So for the first time, I kind of realized there's a world out there that I'm an American, and that's a pretty good thing. You know, people in India loved Kennedy. Well, I started getting older, seventh, eighth grade, listening to the Beatles letting my hair touch my ears, starting to get in trouble at school. And, um, you know, the times went on. I knew about the Vietnam War, but I was all in favor of America. We were the defenders of democracy. We were, you know, like my parents. They were out there doing good stuff. That's what Americans were doing in Vietnam. They were fighting against the communist oppressors. And... I didn't know in 68, I was still, well, you know, we, my grandpa was a Republican, as John Prime says, he voted for Eisenhower because Lincoln won the war. That was the family brand, you know? And so my father was, so I was, you know? But then something happened, which we didn't really hear about in 1968, when uh, uh, the, the AmeriCal division, a, a company went into the small village of Milai and Anki, and they were, they'd lost a bunch of their friends. A really beloved sergeant had been killed the week before, and the captain said he wanted body count, and they gave him body count. Three to 500 of them, you know, children, women, and men. It was the night before Thanksgiving, 19, 69, almost a year and a half later, when I was hearing about the stuff in the Indian newspapers. And I knew they were lying because they were, they'd sort of gotten anti-American now. And I knew Americans would never do anything like this. This was just communist propaganda. And then on Thanksgiving Day, Time magazine arrived. And that was my source of truth right on the cover was that picture of bodies lying on that muddy path. It shattered my faith, you know. Up until then, I knew what I believed in. I believed in America. It just shattered my faith. Now, it wasn't a turning point that I didn't know what I believed in, and it took a long time to figure out what I believed in. And slowly I started figuring out, okay, I questioned this, I questioned that. I pretty soon got to the point where I thought, well, because they'd lied to us about this, they lied to us about everything. So even Stalin must be a good guy. Mao must be a good guy because they lied to us. And so I flipped all the way to the other side. But it's what, what are those turning points? What do they mean in our lives? What are the turning points that you've had? What can we help others make meaning out of their turning points, you know, out of the trauma they face, out of the craziness that on Valentine's Day, a mentally ill person would go in and kill 17 of his fellow students. And at the same time, we'd have a president who I don't know who coincidentally or what, 
but he revoked a rule allowing mentally ill people or restrictions on them in buying guns. How can we make this a turning point for our country? So at this point, what we'd kind of like to do is get other people to ask questions, talk, mention your turning points, and figure out how we can use our own experiences to help turn this country around again. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>